Garrity and Peter Corbin are involved with a project called Smart Communities New Brunswick. The idea is to apply new technology and large-scale databases to help with collective decision-making. Our conversation ranged from seniors and their needs to public transportation to how do we make New Brunswick a better place. Hope you enjoy the conversation. It's, it's here. I mean, you you see where the uh, the the gardens are, the public gardens. Well, people go in there, and 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 I'll say, it's open to everybody. Where you know we know some new new uh, new refugees and immigrants come into the city, and uh, they'll walk, or take the bus over, and uh, and because they're used to that, they'll grow their own food and vegetables. Yep. So that that's building. You know, people are more concerned now where their food comes from. Yep. And the fact that uh, just it, it will be open, it was announced that there's a teaching farm yep. over in the north side. Hayes, Hayes Teaching Farm. Yeah, yep. and that was from the, the old Hayes property, and uh, the owner seen some, he, he, he gave them a few years to get up and running, and he seen the value in it. So teaching people how to grow their own food. So it's... That comes up in several conversations here yeah. on the show because yeah. it's a great space yeah. for playing a little bit. Yep. Um, so the decline of the family farm, then the potential for the return of the family farm some 30 or 40 years later, climate change going on for the food baskets of California or southern United States. So the cost of your food is probably your biggest change in your consumer price index. Mm -hmm. It's bigger than gas. Um, and so, And if New Brunswick imports 95% of its own food, can one of the future economic drivers finally be, um, we were identified forestry, fishing, and farming. That was New Brunswick. Forestry and fishing still carry a certain weight, but yeah. the farming one sort of disappeared, well, right? Yeah. So is there a window now in the next 20 years that we can get at, back at that? I would say soon. I'll let Eric go, but no, I'd, I'd like to no, count. go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. This, this, <laughs> we're having fun with this one. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not a food expert. I know how to eat it. <laughs> I can't grow a tomato plant. But uh, the the local food situation in this province is very complex, mm -hmm. right? You've got a lot of growers that have contracts with the Sobeys and the McCains. Yes. And there are a lot of systems in place to be able to address those markets. Then you've got a lot of smaller markets that it would be a real challenge to hit those larger distributors, but they can distribute to smaller yep. markets, for example. So... In talking to some local food experts, uh, one of the things that I'm learning is that one of the real opportunities is, the, uh, is lowering the transportation cost of local food. So a way to do that, you know, at one point in time, the word Airbnb and Uber is going to come up in this conversation. I think I did once already, is Uberizing local food distribution. So, for example, I don't know the exact prices, but you can guess it will be less than this. So let's say, for example, you've got a farmer with 100 pounds of tomatoes in um, Rexton, right? And he wants to get them to the market in Dieppe. That might cost, I'm picking numbers, so I could yeah. be correct. Let's say it's $100 to pick a number, right? To yep. ship that 100 pounds. Now picture you've got someone in a truck driving from Miramichi to Dieppe. I'm sure that highway's full of trucks every day, right? Mm. With an Uber type app now, he goes tap, tap, and sees that there's 20 or 100 pounds of tomatoes to be taken from Rexton to Dieppe. Uh, who's going to bid on this? I'll pick him up for 20 bucks. You know, that might be my gas money for the trip down, right? So now you're using the market and a, an app like that to be able to distribute food at a much lower cost to the market. Now, granted, there's a, there's going to be uh, issues like, uh, you know, making sure that the, the containment is appropriate from a cooling or heating perspective, cross-contamination, the bonding of the drivers. But all that aside, you know, let's assume that can be addressed. Then with this app, you could actually monitor not only the reduction in cost of getting local food to, to our plates, but also the reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions so we're not hauling them 3,000 miles from the other side of the continent, mm -hmm. right? I'll leave you with one other number on this, and I'll let Eric take over. But I was driving back from Moncton one day, and I'd visited a local market in Moncton. I was doing the quick math, and I thought, you know, if every New Brunswicker spent $1 a day on local food or beverage, that would be a $275 million business. Can you tell me how many businesses in New Brunswick are doing $275 million, and, as and an just, example? And just to interrupt, as a soundbite, um, when Amanda Wildman and Ted Wiggins were on the show um, from the Farmers Union, National Farmers Union in New Brunswick, Amanda had a similar soundbite. She, and she had it from research. She had all her notes and stuff. If everybody spent $13 a week reallocated to buying local, 
would have an impact on local farms of $100 million. I believe that. So <laughs> it's not even, you know, more spending. It's just we allocate to find local. So Correct. then you had a sourcing issue and, and all Correct. that. Correct. But, but she understood the bigger concept and then made it a simple message for people that if we want to solve our own problems, here's one of the avenues that we can go to solve some of our own economic challenges. Correct. Well, I take a different tack than this. And I got, I'm going to scare you. When you when you when you said ninety five percent of the food that people in New Brunswick it, it's it comes important. From yeah. Tomorrow we get that's gone. Tomorrow gone. Yeah. What do we do? Yeah, we have a three day supply yeah. basically in okay. the grocery store. So that's gone. What do we do? Wow. Things would change dramatically. It goes back in the seventies when the energy. Uh, we thought we were okay. You know, cheap gas, forty five cents a gallon. Yeah. Guess what? What do we do? Well. We reacted, mm -hmm. and now we're to a point where we get more oil and gas and we know what to do with We can't get it out fast enough. Yeah. So if if our food chain is, is taken away, then I believe that things will happen, and especially in a rural area, is that you'll see these firms pop up because now people see it as a business opportunity. Back in the oil crisis, we got to develop our own resources, and there's big money in it, yep. big money in it. So... Um, when you have something and somebody takes it away, and I liken that, uh, again, if to say, look, we get half hour to get to the border. Grab what you can and go. And by the way, <laughs> you get to yell at wife and say, I got to go, you got to go too. Yeah. You might not see her again. or you know. And that happens. And yep. that happened when we had these Syrian refugees come in there, and they, they didn't that's, know where their families were. Yep. And some of the atrocities were bad, and there was even more that the demon wouldn't talk about. Yep. So. When hmm. you take those 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 givens you think are given away, yeah. things change dramatically. And you know we got to have food. We got to have and our water supply. If something happened to the city water supply, yep. we've got engineers that will go to the wall to protect the water supply. That's why we, and the province has a has has some real good rules around that that protects our, our well fields. Do we need strengthening? I don't know. I'm not I'm not I'm an expert, but yep. it's something that we got to protect. Yeah. We get to eat and we get to drink. So, I mean, we have to get smarter about that. Yeah. Uh, yes. Really. Because at some point, following a trend pattern, um, that northeast corner of North America, so kind of go down Boston or Cape Cod and come all the way up to Gas Bay. That's like Shangri-La. Some friends of mine call that the Shire because of all these other changes that are going to go on in other parts of North America. So, And we've got a 25-year or 30-year window to try to anticipate what's coming. And, in, and shift accordingly. So more food production, ability to assimilate or integrate uh, more people who are going to move here because they are going to meet. It's coming. It's already started. And then how to maintain some of our, our local identity as well. And, and how do we adapt to have all those pieces fit in a place where, you know, some people would visit New Brunswick and think they're back in the 60s in, in some ways with how we go about things, which is part of the charm and magic of the place. Yes. So how do we not lose that but still... Are we so far behind we can leap ahead without the interim periods? And will this technology help us do that? Well, I think the technology, and sometimes you're a victim of your own success. Hmm. Okay? <laughs> and I'll give, you, I'll give you two examples. One is we've been, uh, our water supply. Yes. We've been doing a lot of work, conserve, conserve, conserve. So conservation goes down. Yep. But as you know, fixed infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, I just have to replace it. Somebody's got to pay for that. Yeah. So if your if your revenues are going down, you still have a we have an infrastructure deficit. So that's going. So you know, because everybody's saving water, we're not getting the revenue to do that. So that means, well, we got to raise the rates. So yeah. People, what are you raising the rates for? Well, we. Yep. We can kick it down the road. We can kick the ball down yeah. to the next generation, yeah. but. That's but, no good. And thanks for bringing that up because that's one of those lovely paradoxes yeah. that in general the public don't quite get their head around. They're more looking at the cost of running their household. They're trying to become more efficient with their household. And they don't quite know the collective impact of what they're doing on a system. And then there's the other thing that, that's irksome maybe for me. I'll, I'll take ownership of it. We sometimes use language that's not appropriate in different sectors. So for me, a lot of business language has made its way into the government sector. So when you're delivering a service for a community, it's very different from running a business trying to earn a profit. So there's yeah. going to be some losses built into it for the sake of equity. Back to the equity issue. So your example of the 100 houses, they pay for themselves 101 houses, you got a whole other thing. 
that's the same as a hospital or a school. Yeah. Or You have to maintain those things in order to create a certain social equity. And that also ties to that we're happy living here because our government, whatever level, is looking after our collective needs. So the consumer or the household sort of needs to understand how those pieces fit. So that's why your water rates are going to go up. But keep doing your best practices because that's an important thing. I was trying to give you wiggle room to kind of give that up for the conversation. You're, well, you know. Yeah, well, 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 you're right because, you know, it's it's just because uh, somebody doesn't use our rinks or our swimming pool or but, I mean, they use our hospital service. So we're all pay taxes, that tax dollar, three levels of government collected, all provide those services. Yep. So at some time in your life, you're going to access different services. And some you won't. But, you know, if you have extended family, your kids might be doing that. So, I mean, you, it's it's far-reaching. Um, uh, the other one I was thinking of is our dumps. It's just garbage. And oh, by the way, there's no politicians that like to cut ribbons on on yeah landfills. Well, well, well that's the theme. No, <laughs> landfills and, and pipes underground because <coughs> can't yeah, see yeah. where is it? Yeah. So there's there's <laughs> another million dollars down. There. Perfect. So there's another change that needs to happen because one day that needs to be sexy because in a lot of our eyes that already is sexy. Um, another past guest, Pat McCarthy, CEO of Recycle New Brunswick, when he was on two years ago. And he can't get it to have any political traction because it's not sexy to cut a ribbon in front of something. He sees a business model and a business opportunity for a large-scale recycling depot done in the Sussex area where Frederick and Moncton and St. John mm -hmm. contribute because then you've got scale. And then you can get to the port of St. John to be doing some stuff. 300 to 400 full-time jobs, good-paying jobs. And he can't get anyone to pay attention to it because it's not sexy. Hmm. So, So... Will this technology help with that? Because we never did get into that. We can get into it now. The recycling end of things, there's food production, but then there's efficiency on plastics and, management, solid and, waste management. You know. And I think that's where data can play a big role in helping improve the efficiencies. Like Eric was mentioning earlier with Lean and Six Sigma and those types of tools, they, they were and are private sector tools to help companies become more efficient. Hmm. The city of Fredericton has saved a lot of money by implementing those types of tools. And I think that I don't think I know that the more data you have with which with which to make a decision or a presentation, especially when it's a boring thing, <laughs> right, uh, will get more people interested. The trouble with the lack of information, especially where we may perceive government services as being inefficient, uh, you know, you're getting taxed at a certain rate, you're getting getting uh, services at a certain rate, uh, but you know, as 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 uh, it becomes more challenging to to, to provide um, public services at any one of the three levels of government. Uh, people are becoming more demanding. Um, mm. You know, governments are challenged. Business models are challenged. Mm. Uh, the more data you have, I believe, is going to is just going to really help improve how to manage those processes. Mm. Uh, and I do believe it's very important as well to um, uh, make sure that all of these types of benefits from smart technologies benefit uh, the citizens and the businesses and, and the community in, uh, in large and in, in any given community uh, and from an investment perspective as well and not just hmm. doing something just because so i think the more we're able to now economically grab data and use data uh, the more informed decisions we can make the more uh, creative and efficient we can be in delivering those services yeah. And it's when it, when it goes back to the politicians, you heard of six thinking hats? Okay, the thinking hat is the black hat, the white hat, negative, the positive, the yellow hat, uh, the, that strictly here's what we know. The blue hat sort of controlling. The red hat is what do you feel in your heart? The green hat, mm. alternatives, right? So you get all these hats and they come to a decision, but they forgot. Boom, the door blows open. In comes the gold hat. The politician said... Oh, that's not going to fly, not going to get elected. <laughs> All that work out the window. Yeah. So we got to get by that. So you got to yes. always keep, when you sit down, the hat's thinking. Is, yeah. is somebody going to come through that door and they say, yeah, that's good. I'm jumping on board and say, yeah. we're shutting her down. Yeah. So yes. it's getting right down to those, those what you're saying is, is truth and fear of losing a service, but 
give up a little here, you're going to get a lot down the road. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it really reinforces the message we can get more done together than we can Absolutely. go on our own way. And we're such a small place. Yeah. But we have those old entrenched behaviors of yeah. which the one that always comes up is the old political behaviors. How do you make a... And I've had this conversation with all the political parties except the liberals haven't made it on here yet. Um, with how do you get at large-scale systemic change when you've got a four-year mindset to your thinking? And especially come the third year or your fourth year, which we're seeing that pattern reinforce itself again where all this money starts to roll out thinking but these challenges that you're looking at are large scale and systemic and your solutions still aren't large scale and systemic well let, let me give you i mean <laughs> i'll take you from from local government and i think this would apply to every government in local government we hire people we try to hire the best and experts yep. we ask for staff report to come back <laughs> here it is here's what we think as experts here's what we wrote so if he said, forget it, then why are we hiring these people to give us advice when we ignore them? Yeah. It's the same in the province. The deputy ministers are experts in the fields. You know, they, they, they want to push forward. They're the ones that will go 30 years. Yes. Right? They're the, 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 the last again. So why don't we pay attention to them? Yep. Hmm. You know, that's the mindset you're talking about. That's what we got to get at. Yep. You know, if we hire these people to give us advice and they know what, what has to be done, then why are we ignoring it? Then it gets into the the political genre, you know. What yeah. makes a politician up? You know, what's a politician feel? Yeah. Are they, are well, they in, in to help people, or are they in it just to? And wouldn't it be nice one day if, when we use the word politician or politics, it actually has another feel to it completely? Because that's another shift that needs to occur. When we say that word, we have a an, an understanding of it that isn't necessarily positive, right? And media yeah. tend to reinforce that. Um, Ten years ago, they do studies on the most trusted or least trusted professions. And Yahoo politicians beat out used car dealers for the least <laughs> trusted. You know, I still remember the headline thing. And you're playing cute, but that's a sad commentary because we count on the politician in the truest sense of or the highest value sense of that word to deal with the collective decision making process that's supposed to benefit everybody rather than just feed a four-year election yeah. cycle. And that's yeah. what we're speaking to. And, I, and we might be right for that. And part of the solution... And heaven forbid New Brunswick do something new, but the thought of a minority government would be a fascinating thing at the provincial level because that's an offset mechanism or a counterbalance mechanism from the entrenched behavior of the political party process. So you wouldn't have to have political reform. You would just have to have a minority government for four years Pretty and enough. say, time you guys start to work that out now further. At, at the risk of using an overused term, I think vision is important, and I think one of the last great vision statements for lack of a better word or uh, was i hate to say this was john f kennedy hmm. in what 1960 or 61 let's put man on the moon right and the usa spent eight or nine years through successive uh, sadly presidents and they achieved their mission eight nine years later right the trouble with putting man on the moon it's that one thing you can get your head around let's win a gold medal in the olympics let's win the stanley cup let's put man on the moon but when when you look at so many complex sort of connected issues it's difficult to wake up in you know 25 years and say okay it's uh, january 1st 2040 now tick we're all happy we have a good quality of life now right it's an ongoing process and not just that that uh, that gold medal at the end of the day, right? And that's why that's what I think makes it challenging. That's why I think vision uh, is a very important, and having a strong leadership to say, okay, this is where we're going, right? And I think that's a, a very very important element in in uh, helping move a lot of these issues uh, towards a better place. Yeah, and, and 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 just to feed off that, it's it's you know the city's gearing up. The communities have to gear up with their internal systems. They have to get that sensors to provide that feedback, and that is then it gets in the analytics. Hmm. You get this information. What is it telling you? Now, the, the, do we as a government, the local government, have to have the people to do that? Yeah, we can. But why don't we put it into the into the free zone? And then we have these startups and these these young coders come in there and, hey, did you look at this? Did you did you ever think of this? Yeah. And that's what's happening now. There's a group called Civ Tech. Civic Tech. Civic Tech. Civic Tech. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, I was going to bring them up. I'm yeah, glad you yeah. Did. It's it, I was over there a couple of times and we've had some discussion because <laughs> they're part of this equation of being smart because yes. what they're Very doing so. and what they're providing, they're providing. Say, look, we're providing free services back into the community to help the communities prosper using data. You know, 
And wouldn't it be nice, as I said before, as a politician, and I can say that because I'm a local politician, the more clear data we have to make a better decision, that's better for everybody. Yep. And do we have to do it? No. I mean, there's people that will volunteer services, and maybe there's a a business opportunity might arise. Mm. Pat, right here in this province, maybe in this city, right across the country. Why do we have to wait for so many in in other parts (laughs) of the world to come up? Yep. You know, we're doing some great things here. So we can't beat ourselves up too bad. No. Nope. But there are things we have to start paying attention to. And, you know, fairness and, you know, sacrifice a bit and, and play the long game. As you say, the four years are the short game. But we got to think beyond that short game. Yeah. And that's my opinion anyway. Great. That's great. great. Um, time to wrap up. How would you like to close this out? Well, uh, as I say, uh, um, when you talk about smart communities, it's I, I, I think it's, it's a movement uh, coming our way. Uh, the federal government is big time, as you know, the Smart City Challenge. Uh, we're into a group of uh, population un- under uh, half a million, $10 million prize, two $10 million prize. So the communities are jostling for that. Uh, the big cities, they're in the big boy club, there's $50 million prize, so... Uh, so the, the governments know what they have to do. They know we have to be smarter on what we do, and we'll get to that point. And with a little help and a little ingenuity, mm-hmm. we can get there. I think I've had the opportunity to talk to at least 100 people so far as a, uh, through this project scope. And what's been wonderful about it is the people I've met are doers, and they want to get things done. And... You know, typically you look at silos, right? And there are people in the energy sector and the people in the social services sector and people in the food sector and other sectors, and they, they tend to stick in their silos. Um, we're, ha- we're having a conference on uh, March 28th here in Fredericton, and we're going to be taking people from various sectors that are all doers, and we're going to put them all in the same room. And I really think by making those connections in itself will really help accelerate a lot of this work where people may not have been aware of each other's work in the past, regardless of the sector. But as you know yourself, we all know here, you put a bunch of people in a room that like to get stuff done, it will get done. So that's how I would wrap up this session with you, Dennis. It's great. Thank you so much. A great conversation. Oh, okay. great. Thank, Thank you. you, Dennis. Thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. Thank you.